So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead. All right, so um, here's kind of the outline for, for the talk today, and this was alluded to by Paul. First, we'll start with uh, a quick overview um, and then get into Solar Pilot, talk about some of the uh, recent development there and a general overview of the tool. We'll also give a couple examples. One is looking at how to go about optimizing a power tower system and then um, looking at a couple of examples of, of scripting. Uh, we'll then quickly talk about Soltrace, uh, giving a, a brief overview um, and talk about some of the recent development, especially as it relates to power tower systems. Um, and then we'll show an example of how you might use Solar Pilot and Soltrace to model a power tower's optical performance. Um, the last part of this is going into some detail about the open source projects. Um, so we'll talk through uh, what that means and how you actually go about retrieving and compiling the code. And if you do decide that you want to uh, contribute to these projects, uh, we'll give some steps and guidelines for doing that. And as Paul said, I hope to reserve a little bit of time at the end for uh, questions and answers. And, and I'll do my best to move through the material so that we have enough time uh, and part of why I reserved an hour and a half is because usually we, we end up uh, running out of time at the end. And so it'd be nice to, to reserve a few minutes there. So uh, we'll try to do that. Um, if you're interested in uh, other webinars or um, would like to have the link to the recordings, you can visit the sam.nrl.gov slash webinars page. Um, this one is listed there, which, which may be where you found it in the first place. Um, but the recordings will be uh, made available um, sometime after we're, we're done here, probably in, in the next few days. Okay, so uh, just a, a quick um, update on who, who I am, who's talking to you right now. My name is Mike Wagner. I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I lead a couple of different projects at NREL. Um, I've been there for almost 10 years now, started in 2009. Um, I'm the author of Solar Pilot and several of the CSP models in SAM, particularly the power tower models, um, or the, the molten salt models, some of the trough models. Uh, and I work with uh, others on the team who contribute uh, very strongly to that as well. Um, I'm not just a, a modeler, I'm not just a software developer. I'm also um, active in other research areas, including operations and maintenance optimization and development of uh, some next gen CSP technologies, uh, specifically um, around the gas phase HDF uh, systems. Um, I've, I've written a few things and uh, had my education at University of Wisconsin and um, my PhD at the Colorado School of Mines. Um, if you are interested in my contact information, you can just follow that link and there's um, email and, and phone there if you feel compelled. Um, I do want to acknowledge uh, Tim, Tim Wendelin. Uh, he was the original and lead author of Soul Trace. Um, he's recently retired from NREL after a, a long and storied career and is now a senior engineer at Solar Dynamics, which is a CSP development company. Um, so he's been instrumental in a lot of this work as well, and I, I don't attempt to take credit for a lot of the stuff that he's done. Okay, so we'll uh, start off with talking about Solar Pilot. Um, so Solar Pilot is uh, a butchered acronym. It stands for Solar Power Tower Integrated Layout and Optimization Tool. Um, Solar Pilot uh, allows you to define and characterize uh, power tower uh, CSP solar fields. Um, it's really a research and design tool for power tower optical subsystems. It's not for the larger uh, plant or thermal storage or anything. Um, the user interface that you see here on the right is tied into a detailed simulation code, but those two entities are actually separate. Uh, and we'll get in, into that more in detail later. Solar Pilot was developed at NRO uh, in part with DOE funding, uh, which is much appreciated. Um, and Solar Pilot has been integrated uh, not only in, into the UI, but also into SAM um, as the Power Tower Optical Characterization Engine. If you're interested in uh, learning more about some of the, the technical details on Solar Pilot, we just uh, finally published a paper on this in Solar Energy, and that's 
available now online for those of you who have a, a subscription there. Um, but otherwise, it will be uh, released in the journal in uh, September of this year. So for those who are, aren't totally familiar with SolarPilot or have used it a little um, and want to know what I think it's for, uh, here's what I think uh, SolarPilot is for. It's a tool for creating heliostat field layouts and characterizing optical performance. Um, that's really its primary role. It's good at screening potential development sites if you're a developer. It's good at optimizing solar field design parameters, investigating heliostat performance in detail. It's good at optical uh, calculations using both the ray trace and analytical routines, which um, again, we'll talk a little bit about later. And it's a tool that's in use by researchers, developers, and universities. Um, what it is not uh, is a tool for annual solar field production analysis. That's really the domain of SAM. Um, it doesn't include power block or thermal energy storage simulation tools. It doesn't include detailed cost analysis, although it does do the, the cost uh, worksheet for the solar field portion. And it doesn't have um, financial modeling involved, so you're not able to really calculate LCOE or internal rate of return or anything um, that an investor might care about. Um, for those, we tend to use Solar Pilot to do the design work and then um, do that financial analysis in SAM or some other uh, spreadsheet tool. Um, and then uh, lastly, it's not a tool for ignoring due diligence and it's not a tool that will always give you the right answer. And I think that's true for, for pretty much every software, but every piece of software, but you know, it's easy to forget that. Um, and it's easy to just blindly take whatever the tools spitting out without really thinking about what's going on. And um, just right up front, I'd like to, to offer that observation that uh, this should not be a, a replacement for common sense and engineering judgment and things like that. So, okay, so uh, here's just a list of the capabilities. I think, you know, we've kind of touched on this already to, to some degree. Um, so, Again, you see that Solar Pilot does the layouts, uh, but you can also import heliostats if you've got a particular layout in mind. Um, it simulates optical performance uh, of the field, but you can also look at just individual heliostats and look at the flux profiles uh, in simulating one or a select group of heliostats. Um, Solar Pilot has the ability to include multiple receivers, and so you can uh, simultaneously uh, model a field with multiple receivers. You can characterize the flux profiles at different solar positions and irradiance levels like any good optical tool should, uh, should provide. Um, you can impose heliostat aiming algorithms for flux profile control and there's several different algorithms that I won't get into in detail, um, but you can go anywhere from you know simple aim point strategies where you're just aiming at the center of the receiver um, up to uh, kind of progressive algorithms that place heliostats one at a time and re-evaluate the flux density on the receiver at, at each point. Um, Solar Pilot can optimize a wide range of parameters for the lowest cost of energy, and I should put an asterisk there, uh, we'll get into that. Uh, it can plot field performance and flux intensity. It can do scripting um, using the LK language. And uh, one of the key Parts of the model is that it's got this integrated uh, calculation engine with both the analytical and with the soul trace ray tracing models. So there's some confusion um, about what it means uh, to say Solar Pilot or what what the entity we're referring to when we talk about it. Um, Solar Pilot actually comes basically in two forms. The first is the standalone tool. Um, and that tool provides substantial functionality, and that's really what we'll be talking about today. Um, the second flavor is what's baked into SAM, and so the SAM Power Tower characterization uh, routines are handled by Solar Pilot. And so you can see on the left here, we've got the user interface uh, for the standalone tool, and uh, just pull the screen, grab the results. You can see there's a lot of detail there if you squint. Um, it calculates all the different efficiency mechanisms and um, you know peak and minimum flux and, and a lot of detail. Um, whereas if you look at, at the SAM tool, that's really a high level uh, total heliostat field optical performance with limited uh, ability to change the, uh, the configuration. 
Okay, so going through a little bit on, on how Solar Pilot works, um, the field layout process is, is something that I'm, I'm often asked about. So I uh, wrote up what the algorithm entails. Um, it's the uh, seven steps that are involved. Um, and every time that it's, it's generating a layout, it, it goes through this process. So first, uh, what it will do is, uh, you know, I, I guess step zero would be you would, you would go into the user interface and you would put in the inputs and settings that you want to um, examine, obviously, and then you go to step one and hit the hit the field layout button. It then collects all these inputs from the input pages. Uh, it goes into a pre-processing step where it looks at the weather data uh, and generates a set of uh, simulation points that is going to evaluate the heliostat positions for performance. Uh, step three, uh, it generates a list of all possible positions that lie within both the land boundaries and any layout rules that you choose. So that could include um, receiver or, um, uh, minimum and maximum azimuthal angles on the receiver, so acceptance angles. That could include uh, minimum and maximum distances from the from the base of the tower, um, and it and it can include uh, land boundaries, as it says there. Uh, step four is it simulates the performance of the field uh, for each possible heliostat in the layout from step three over the set of simulation points generated in step two. So it's essentially trying to go through and create uh, some estimate of what the annual production from the field is going to be. But it does that by taking just a subset of representative uh, days and hours in, in the year. Uh, five, it sorts all the possible heliostats by the performance metric that you specify. Um, typically, that would be total power produced. It could also be efficiency. It could also be uh, cosine efficiency or blocking efficiency or some other um, probably less meaningful selection. Um, and notably, it can also be a, a time of dispatch weighted power production. So if you have some kind of uh, uh, financial structure in which you get more power in the afternoon, you might want to tell you your field to produce during that time. And so you can weight the power um, by those uh, values. Step six, it calculates the power delivered by each heliostat at the reference condition. So now we've got uh, a list of heliostats with all their power production, and then it, it sorts that. Uh, it, ca it calculates the power delivered at the reference condition uh, which might be something like summer solstice at noon. Um, and then it goes through and deletes the heliostats that have been sorted in step five in order of worst performing to best performing until the power delivered at the reference condition um, is no longer satisfied. So it just chops off all the really bad heliostats up until the point where your, your design point condition uh, power meets your, um, your specified power. Okay, um, so if you choose to not go ahead with that algorithm, I mentioned that you can actually import your own layout. Um, and that's really useful if you are you know, developing a particular site and you just wanna use Solar Pilot to uh, provide third party validation or something like that. Um, so what you do is you go in to Solar Pilot on the field layout page, uh, there's a button for import so you can go ahead and click the button there, and then you go through and uh, uh, select the file that you want to import. Now over on the left, you can see these are all the, the possible columns that are involved. So there's 14 columns that you need to provide, uh, up to 14 columns. Um, the first, uh, say five or six are, are mandatory. You have to provide those. And the other uh, remaining columns, you can leave blank if you don't have that data or you want the, the tool to calculate that for you. So you can see up on the left, we've got a sample file, a spreadsheet, it's just a CSV file um, with the different entries corresponding to that table. So assuming we've now got a, a layout in place, the next step is to do performance calculations. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a couple ways to do this, uh, the ray tracing or the analytical. Uh, so the ray tracing, which is a, a numerical or probabilistic approach, um, in principle, it can model any uh, surface-based geometry, although we do limit the, the surface types in Solar Pilot. Uh, it can characterize flux intensity, directionality, and multiple surface interactions, unlike an analytical model, which is unable to 
do anything beyond that first uh, flux intensity. Um, but the problem typically with ray tracing codes is that they're computationally intensive. You're, you're essentially treating uh, each computation as a photon and you need a large number of them uh, to really get a clear picture of what the flux density is on different surfaces. Uh, and that's especially true when you've got a lot of uh, surfaces involved and you have to test each surface to see whether a particular ray is interacting with it. Uh, the second option is the analytical. Uh, so it uh, uses a Gaussian approximation. Um, I didn't put it in here, but uh, this approximation is based on uh, sort of a Taylor series expansion and actually uses something called uh, Hermite polynomials. And that was first developed uh, or first uh, applied to this, um, to, to power towers uh, by uh, Lips and Van Hall back in uh, the late 70s. And so there's a, a kind of a long history here um, for this algorithm. Uh, came through, Adelsol 3 was a, another tool that used it. Uh, and we adopted a lot of the conventions that uh, Delsol 3 had, had put forward. So the, the analytical approach is really ideal for use in uh, layout and optimization calculations because it's so fast. Um, but the problems with it are that it doesn't provide any directionality detail, so you can't have multiple interactions and surfaces, and you can't really understand where the flux is coming from. You just know that there's a, a particular intensity uh, as a function of position on the absorber surface. Um, and generally, it's not as accurate or as flexible as ray tracing. Um, so I would say that these two approaches are really complementary, um, and it's it's good to know when to use uh, one or the other tool, um, because not you know each one's not going to be right in every circumstance. All right, so, so now that we've uh, done our performance simulation, uh, what SolarPilot will then do is provide um, both a field performance plot and a flux intensity plot. Uh, the field performance plot uh, gives a, a illustration and information on how each heliostat in the uh, layout performs. Um, so you can see on the right here, we've got uh, the default system simulated in some afternoon hour. So there's shadows being cast uh, from west to east. You can see that in kind of the, the detailed call out on the top there. Um, and what you see in the field is that uh, the efficiency responds to the sun position, of course. So because the sun is in the west, um, the heliostats to the west are less efficient uh, in terms of cosine efficiency. And so you see that re reflected in the plot that there's not, um, they're not quite as strong in the afternoon. Um, but the plot in general, it displays the positions. Uh, it can display land constraints. So if you've got custom land boundaries, um, you can look at the field plot and uh, visualize those boundaries. And we'll actually look at that in a minute. Um, and you can you can go into detail and look at efficiency on each heliostat. Um, the plot itself is interactive, so you can select heliostats and, and remove them uh, from the layout or add them back in if you want to. That's that's a new feature. Um, and data can, of course, be exported into tabular format. Um, so just to give you a picture of what this uh, looks like, what the, the field plot looks like, um, here we've got a particular layout. And I've already set this up. Um, actually, what I want to do is uh, create a new one here. So we'll come into Solar Pilot, uh, start it up, and we'll just run uh, the default layout. So we'll do that from the field layout page that appears here. Um, so you can see that actually we can move the plot, we can zoom in if we want um, and look around at uh, individual heliostats. And if we want to look at data for those heliostats, we can click this button up here. This shows heliostat data points when we're in zoom mode. So we can actually zoom in um, and see detailed uh, performance information. So here we're plotting total efficiency, but we might also want to look at uh, cosine efficiency or um, delivered power or something else. Um, now, if we decide we want to get uh, a lot of detail on each heliostat, what we can do is right click on a particular heliostat. And I'll make the font a little bigger so you can see it. Um, but now that I've right clicked on this heliostat here, you can see the, the stats for it. We want to look at the stats for multiple heliostats. Just hold down the control button 
and click around and you can get um, statistics for uh, multiple heliostats. Okay, now if we wanted to say remove these particular heliostats, as I mentioned, we can come up here, delete the selected heliostats. And then when we run uh, the performance calculation again, um, those will be uh, no longer present in the results. Um, oh, one other one other point to make here while I'm while I'm at it is if you do want to save, you can save the figure um, and you can change the resolution. So if you want a really high resolution figure, you can do that. Or if you want to export the data, you can do that here, and you can choose uh, which data and how the file is formatted. Um, also uh, possible is to look at the, the flux intensity on the receiver. So Solar Pilot generates flux intensity plots for all the receiver surfaces. If you've got multiple ones, you can actually select which receiver you want to look at. Uh, the field can be simulated at any uh, sun position or DNI value, uh, and the plots can be scaled and adjusted for uh, the resolution that you want. Um, so here on the, on the, the left two plots, you see um, a simulation for a particular field uh, in the morning and in the, or sorry, this is the afternoon and right around midday. And this field is not symmetric. And so you see um, some uh, differences in, in how the, the flux profile appears around the cylinder of the receiver. Um, over on the right, what we see is uh, the flux aiming map. And what this is, is a, a plot of the aim points for the receiver. Uh, the color of the dot corresponds to the average distance um, that heliostats are from the receiver that are aiming at that point. So if you've got a bunch of heliostats that are very close to the receiver, um, hence they have very small images, uh, they're going to be colored blue on this plot. And heliostats that are very far from the receiver that have large images, they're colored uh, yellow. Um, and so you see this uh, this nice distribution where a lot of the heliostats that are further away, the furthest away heliostats, um, actually I'm just noticing now that this uh, color bar is a little bit off, but um, it should be uh, uh, roughly correct here, but the furthest heliostats um, go towards the center of the receiver because their images are big and the small ones kind of fill in the gaps around the edges. Um, the size of the dot corresponds to the number of heliostats that are aiming at a point. So if you've got small dots, that means uh, only a few heliostats are aimed there. With the large ones, there's a lot of heliostats that share that, uh, that aim point. Okay, so that's kind of the quick overview of uh, Solar Pilot. Um, so what I wanted to do now is get into a couple examples uh, and looking at how you might go about using Solar Pilot to optimize a particular uh, power tower system that uh, is, is within a specified land boundary and, um, and has some different constraints. Um, so before we do that, we'll talk a bit about how you go about this optimization process. So, you know, why do we want to optimize? Well, maybe it's obvious, but power tower design is complex and there are a lot of trade-offs. So it's not always clear, you know, do I want a taller tower? Do I want a bigger receiver? Do I want uh, more heliostats? I mean, there's all these different dimensions to the problem that um, make it really difficult to just a priori know what uh, the right answer is going to be. Uh, while fortunately many input parameter values can be optimized and Solar Pilot provides uh, the capability to, to do that. Um, so the Solar Pilot uses the, the Kobila algorithm. Um, that's called, that's actually an acronym for constrained optimization by uh, linear approximation. Um, it's a um, nonlinear optimization algorithm, but what it does is it, it uh, finds the steepest descent, follows it, and if you run into a constraint, say um, peak flux in this case uh, for power tower applications where your, your receiver is exceeding the peak flux limitation, um, then it, it does something else rather than continue down the steepest descent. Um, so it represents the objective function, which is shown below as a multidimensional linear surface uh, within a local trust region. So it's form formulating this, this linear model within a little region around uh, where the last iterations were. 
um, and it optimizes uh, that way. Um, as I mentioned, it incorporates a nonlinear constraint, which is allowable peak flux, and that can only be obtained by running Solar Pilot. Um, you can't really you know, come up with a simple relationship that's algebraically uh, meaningful. Solar Pilot calculates the actual peak flux for a given design and then compares it with this value uh, to figure out how to proceed in the optimization. So the objective function actually is kind of like a pseudo levelized cost of energy. So it's the total cost of the solar field portion as calculated on the cost page, um, divided by the expected energy that you're gonna get throughout the year. And that expected energy that E uh, expect is um, determined by the, the sample days that you choose uh, during the layout process. So you're only maybe simulating four or eight or 10 days and every other hour within that day. But that serves, uh, the, the total energy that's uh, produced during those uh, days and hours serves as a, a surrogate for uh, the annual production, um, at least uh, relatively speaking. Um, so you see this, this LCOE and then on the right hand side, we've got this term um, that basically penalizes systems that don't produce at least the design point power. So if you're um, trying to continually reduce cost, but you're falling below your target power, it'll penalize that uh, and try to get you back up to your, your target power. So here on the right side, you can see the dialogue for selecting uh, optimization variables. This is available on the optimization page. Um, I've just expanded one menu. Um, this, this menu contains a lot of different items and a lot of them you might not want to optimize. A lot of them are just settings. So use your judgment when you're going through this and, and don't indiscrim indiscriminately check these boxes, make sure that these are meaningful variables. All right, so we'll do a little case study, um, just looking at uh, creating a new plant near Phoenix, Arizona. Um, in this example, we just imagine that there's um, an agricultural enterprise that's selling cultivated land, they, they no longer want to uh, farm that land, um, but it's near transmission and it's got a good DNA resource. Um, and I, I'll leave the link in there for this uh, particular site. It goes to the uh, NREL uh, solar radiation database. Uh, but basically a, a developer would like to build a tower facility at the location, but needs to evaluate the property for power production potential, uh, tower height and tower location. Well, fortunately, a solar pilot can help. So we'll try and, and uh, stumble through this example and see um, what we get out of it. So first we'll open up solar pilot. Um, and the first step that we want to take actually is outlined here. Um, so we want to identify the location and uh, download the weather file. So I've already, I've already done that. Um, I'm not going to do it now because it's sort of extraneous to what we're doing. Um, but you can go to the solar radiation database, find your location, click it. Um, it'll send you to the right uh, the right link. Um, as I said, open Solar Pilot and specify the parameters. So in this case, we want something around 450 megawatts, um, and that could be fine tuned. But we'll come in here to our layout setup page on our solar field design power and specify 450. Um, our best guess, maybe we don't know better, and or maybe there's some uh, previous experiment experience, but our best guess for the tower height is maybe 150 on that, um, which incidentally is actually not a very good guess. Um, we do want to specify the climate file. Um, we'll take our best guess as to tower height and position, as I said, we'll come back to that. And we want to uh, manipulate the land constraint. So this particular example um, is interesting because it's taking existing land and trying to build within it. So one of the features of Solar Pilot um, is that it's able to take geometry that you specify in Google Earth or some other KML file generator. You can actually import that. So we, we can go ahead and do that now. So here's our um, Google Earth view. And I've already kind of uh, got things set up here, but um, we'll go ahead and, and zoom in. So we are somewhere outside of uh, Phoenix there, out in the desert. And I was just looking around and found some interesting agricultural land and maybe this would be a good place to build a plant if they're selling it. Um, so what you can do is come in here um, 
And the first thing you might want to do is say, well, I want to draw the outer bounds of my plant. So there's this little add polygon feature here. Um, you can come in and actually start to just create a, a polygon that goes around the land that you might want to um, use. So we do that. Uh, maybe we come over here and the neighbors don't want us too close. So we'll just jog over here, uh, et cetera. So it could look something like that. Okay, so I've already I've already done that actually. Um, so here's the the one I generated previously. This is our our area of interest. Um, the other thing we need to do is specify the location of the tower, um, and that, as we'll see, can change. But you know, just roughly, we may want to put something in there. So we select the pin, drop a pin, name it. Now, one of the nice things about this uh, technique is that we're actually able to specify exclusion areas uh, that correspond to roads or maybe cultural sensitivities. So the same way I did the polygon, um, I've also done that for, uh, you can see there's a road up here. I've done that road. Um, you can see that there's a road on the east. Let's see if I can just make that a little clearer. Um, there's uh, maybe a little cultural exclusion down here. Maybe there's a little um, a, a site of interest that they say, okay, you can't disturb that. Um, and so now we've got kind of our layout set up. Uh, what you then do is you come here, do a save place as, and send that to, as a KML file, to some place where you, you can keep track of it. So you can get as detailed as you want in this process. Um, for now, this is a fairly simple geometry, fairly simple example, um, but we'll, we'll stick with that for now. Okay, so now we go over to Solar Pilot, our new case here, and what we want to do is um, set up this land uh, area. So we come in here, and over here is the field boundaries selection. By default, it just does a circular outer bound and a circular inner limit sort of exclusion area. So you can see maximum field, minimum field rate, uh, radius. These are uh, multiply the tower height. So the, the taller the tower, the further the field can go out. Um, we're actually going to um, drop that and we want to use the land boundary array. So we then need to import these arrays because we just saved them from Google. So um, the first thing we'll do is we'll find our main inclusion. That was this primary, uh, what I named primary. So we click open on that. But now what we have to do is because the KML file is in uh, degrees, uh, uh, spherical coordinates, we need to have a reference to something. We need to know um, where exactly that is with respect to the tower position because the tower position is important to Solar Pilot. So you can either do that uh, specification by coming in here and putting in the latitude and longitude, although I don't really recommend that because you kind of got to be detailed. Um, instead, what I would do is uh, we save that tower location as a KML. So we click from file, click tower, click open, and it'll populate the tower location that you saved. Now there's two types of uh, polygons that we can add, uh, either inclusion or exclusion. And inclusion is an area that's allowed to contain heliostats. And an exclusion is an area that uh, excludes heliostats from, from that polygon. So the first one is an inclusion. Uh, what we want to do is we've got this table down here. Um, we don't want to append this first one. We want to actually replace the table. So we click OK. And now you can see down here um, we've got x and y coordinates of that polygon that we generated in Google Earth. Um, we, do, we do need to do the same thing for the exclusion. So we had the, the north road, open that. It'll keep your coordinates, but this is now an exclusion. We'll append it. Uh, we had the east road. Let's see, which did I do? I can't remember. North road, east road. That'll be fine. Um, oops. Okay, so we've got these different exclusions, um, which looks like I did that one. Uh, poorly. Um, here, we'll, we'll go ahead and start this uh, over because it didn't go the way I wanted to.
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open a file that I already had that set up. All right, so here we can see I've, I've done the, the inclusions and exclusions, and they appear in this table. Um, the, so they appear as, if it's inclusion, it's, it's type I. Uh, the first inclusion is zero. If it's an exclusion, it's type E, and the second exclusion, or the first exclusion is zero, the second is one, and so on. So you can have as many of those as you want. Uh, one thing I would maybe recommend is you can then export the table and save these coordinates for later if you don't want to go through that process again. Um, there is an option here if you have uh, certain exclusions that are dependent on the tower position, so say like um, a power block area or something like that, you can make all the exclusions relative um, to, the, to the change in tower position. Um, so here, uh, you can also specify an offset for the tower. So if you wanted to make it uh, offset from that nominal position, you can do that. All right, so, so we've kind of set things up the way we wanted now. We had 450. Let me just go ahead and set this back to 150. And uh, this was zero, zero. We didn't have a good guess for that. Um, what I also want to do, incidentally, while we're here, is I do want to um, I do want to include a minimum distance for the power block. Um, so if you look at the at the layout right now, uh, you will see that the, this is this is the land that we specified, right? This is this corresponds to the polygons we created. Our towers right there. Here's our little cultural exclusion and a couple roads. Um, so that's good. Um, but what we don't have is something in the middle here to exclude. Uh, Healy stats uh, based on you know the fact that we have to have a power block, we have to have storage, etc. Um, so we can do that by doing multiple of these uh, overlaid on top of each other. So we would do uh, this as well, bound scale with tower height, but then just go ahead and make sure that the maximum field radius is greater than what you have up here. So I set it at 12. Um, you probably could go higher than that, but it's going to make sure that any Healy stat in this layout satisfies all the constraints. All right, so uh, if we do the layout, hopefully this will work the way I want it to. Um, yep, what we end up with is um, a heliostat field within our land boundaries. And you can see the heliostats are excluded from this region. Uh, they, they don't go over the roads. But in fact, they don't actually quite fill up the entire area. Um, some of them are missing. We, we were able to get 450. Uh, megawatts out of this field without having to fill up the entire land boundary. Um, but what we haven't done yet is we haven't really optimized this. So that's that's one of the next steps we want to get to here. So we've, we're have we right here on five. We run, we've ran the layout. Uh, the next thing we want to do is optimize. We need to set up our optimization table. Um, and we'll keep track of these settings here. So if we go back to Solar Pilot, look at our optimization tab, which is right here. Um, you can see that there is this, uh, this table here that specifies the different variables that we want to optimize, uh, lower bounds, upper bounds, and the initial step size for optimization. So if you want to add or remove uh, from these, you can do that. You can click, we'll just start over here. So we click this, we click remove. So we can uh, try to do that. Click remove, and then we can add and the variables that we want. So in this case, we wanted the tower uh, offset and optical height. So we search for it, x, y, optical height. That's what we just had. All right, so the um, importance of these settings um, should be discussed here. The, the lower bound is a value that uh, limits uh, how low uh, the, the, basically the minimum that this particular variable can assume. And same for the upper bound, but but a uh, maximum. Um, if you don't provide those, it'll just try to search around, uh, and it may or may not get out of a local uh, a local optimum. Um, but really, it's better if you can give the algorithm some idea, some information about where it should be searching, uh, what what's sort of the full extent. Uh, 
of the, the variable space. So in this case, I think, um, just see if I can get both of these set up. So I, I just arbitrarily put in, um, so for the X and Y, we do maybe our initial, or our lower bound is uh, minus 300. So we don't want the tower uh, and the X direction to be further than 300 uh, meters to the west in this case. Um, and we want we don't want the upper bound uh, the tower further than 500 meters to the east. Uh, and we'll say maybe a, a significant initial step is going to be 50. Now in the initial step, it's it's really important to choose this carefully because if you make that value too small, um, there's going to be virtually no difference between uh, the two objective function values between iterations. Like if it's just moving the tower one meter, uh, you're not going to see really any change, and, and the algorithm's going to think, oh, I'm, I'm perfect where I am. Uh, let's not go anywhere. On the other hand, if you make it too big, then you might lose um, some, of the, um, some of the resolution between where you currently, you know, where you start and where, where you jump to. So it kind of takes you out of the, the region where you have some confidence if it's too big. So for me, I think 50 probably makes sense. You're going to see a, somewhat of a change with 50. Um, so that's why I chose that. So we'll go ahead and do the, the offset and the Y. Uh, so we, don't, we want that to be between minus 50 and 600, and again, 50 on that step. And the tower height, um, we won't limit that uh, just to see what happens. And our step, we'll just make a round number at 10. Now, you might be curious, um, there's not an input here for initial value. Um, and that's what this is. So the initial value from the optimization algorithm is taken from the input pages. So you need to, you do need to make sure that as we go through this process that everything you specify in here um, corresponds to where you want the, the algorithm to start looking. So here we need, we've already got 150, but now we need our initial to be minus 200. So it's going to move that to the west and it's going to move it to the north. Okay, so there, I think we've pretty much got things set up unless I've uh, forgotten something. Um, so we go back to the optimization tab. Uh, just make sure, flip through here, make sure everything looks right. I left the, the heliostat and the receiver page alone, but you could easily imagine doing optimization around um, the receiver dimensions as well. Um, okay, so now we've got our optimization. So let's go ahead and run that. So if we click run, um, you'll see that here it's going to start generating um, these simulations. And this is the progress. Now, actually, what you might want to do is uh, uncheck this box so that you don't have these uh, progress updates all the time. And it actually runs a little bit faster if it's not constantly having to, um, to ping the progress on the optimization. So um, so it's running now, and we'll, we can look at it as it goes. Um, so this is the log window, and you can see uh, what's coming out is the iteration number, the variable uh, listing here. So we've got tower offset in X, tower offset in Y, tower height, the objective function value, the peak flux, and the plant cost. So here's our X offset, our Y offset, our tower objective function, peak flux and cost. And as you go, you can see uh, we want to be minimizing the objective function. So we started off um, a little bit higher there. Uh, let's see if I can make this a little bigger. So we started off our objective at 304. That's like a pseudo LCOE. And just with our optimization so far, we've dropped it down to 224, 223, something like that. Um, meanwhile, we're still satisfying our maximum flux limitation, which is set to 1,000 in this case. All right, so the algorithm has converged, and we found that the, the offset for this better case is somewhere closer to the middle, but actually we were off with our initial tower placement. We probably should have had it about 175 meters uh, to the north. And our tower height guess of 150 was, was not great, um, but it was close. We ended up at at 179. So here we see the, the final objective and the elapsed time. Now, if you do nothing and you just leave this as it is, the uh, 
the system that's in this setup is going to stay the same because you all, all we've done is run the optimization. It hasn't actually applied anything um, to the case that you ran because you could you, know, you could imagine that you run a case it doesn't give you back a productive answer, so you don't want it to overwrite um, the inputs that you had working there. Um, in this case, though, we do because we we came up with a much better answer. So to do that, we click Apply to Inputs, and it's going to go through and for our three variables, it's going to overwrite the values that we had in there before. So there we are, uh, 180 uh, and our tower location, etc. So now if we click our layout, we'll see um, that the field uh, looks a little better. It moved up, and if we run uh, if we run a performance simulation, um, we'll see that uh, we're doing okay in terms of efficiency and everything. So, so that's a quick overview of the optimization and gives you kind of a flavor of how to do this process for uh, custom field layouts. So we'll go back to the presentation here. All right. All right. Um, so Solar Pilot also provides scripting, and I won't go into too much detail on this, but it's a really nice capability um, that's actually somewhat new as well. So uh, I mentioned before the extensiveness of the settings for Solar Pilot. There's a lot that goes into it, so you might want to set up scripts that um, deal with that setting of inputs or retrieving data, uh, manipulating things as, as you want. So um, the real the, the goal though of it is to provide an interface. Uh, that gives you a mechanism for, for easy retrieval and uh, of input and output parameters. Um, so here's an example of what the a script might look like. You might define a function. Um, it's it's written, the syntax is kind of like C++ um, or Python or some combination of that. Um, and it's written using LK, <clears throat> excuse me, and LK is a scripting language developed by NREL for our uh, modeling tools. Um, so this is also used in SAM and, and SolTrace uh, and SDK tool, um, so it might look familiar. Uh, but there are several custom functions here in Solar Pilot, like add land area, run layout, get layout. These are all specific to this particular interface, even though the language itself is, is pretty consistent. So here's some exa examples of what you might do with uh, scripting. Um, so we've got a case here where we had some local soiling from a road, and so we selected uh, Healy stats at random in the direction of the wind um, to the east of the road and affected their reflectivity. And you can kind of see the, the discoloration there corresponds to lower reflectance. Uh, we can look at really complex cloud shapes. You could take a vector graphics editor like Inkscape, uh, draw a cloud, or if you had a, an algorithm that actually looked at real clouds. Uh, you know something useful like beyond what us uh, researchers do and um, and looked at real clouds and generated a, a vector graphics uh, path from that you could actually use scripting to impose that path on your field and look at uh, cloud impacts um, they can handle um, different templates so i just to illustrate that created a couple different heliostat templates some with large heliostats some with small and randomly placed them around uh, the tower. Um, and you can also do kind of um, cheesy stuff like put your graphics in heliostat fields. So, uh, But it's, it's pretty flexible and is, um, is a nice capability to have. All right, so let's move along to SolTrace. Um, we'll talk a, uh, in less detail about SolTrace, uh, partially because I know less about it, um, because I'm not really the original author of it, but partially because um, you know, a lot of the same principles for Solar Pilot are covered uh, with SolTrace, and I think people are generally more familiar with SolTrace than they are with Solar Pilot. Um, okay, so uh, a quick overview of the tool. Um, sorry, I apologize. The formatting on this didn't quite make it. Um, so the Sol the SolTrace tool. I'll actually, go look at the tool here. Um, the way that that SolTrace works is it takes um, it takes uh, rays essentially from the position of the sun uh, and it casts them into a bounding box that surrounds a particular geometry. So if you if you contain all the geometry that you specify within a, a rectangle, it'll just randomly sample rays 
uh, within that rectangle for intersection with elements. Um, those uh, rays, as they interact with the uh, surfaces, might reflect, they might refract, they might be absorbed, um, and they might actually reflect off and, and hit other geometry within that uh, profile. So um, you can specify all the different um, optical properties. Um, here we've got three different optical property sets that correspond to different surfaces in our system. Um, you can specify uh, any really any sun shape that you want. So here we've got intensity as a function of displacement from this, the center of the sun. Um, and that's expressed here as a table. And then you can list all the different elements. So here we've generated a heliostat field uh, layout, and you can see that there's a huge number of elements here. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of, of elements that it's simulating. Um, the receiver, on the other hand, is quite a bit simpler. It's just a, just a simple uh, cylinder with a, a shield on the bottom. All right. Um, it goes through and allows you to trace. So if we go back to our uh, slides, we can look at um, uh, what, what's happening here. So it allows you to go through and do some, some ray tracing and set those parameters. Um, in terms of the recent development of this tool, um, there's really been two areas that we've been focusing on. One is the user interface, which I just showed you. So the, the interface uh, has been ported from uh, QT, which is a, a GUI toolkit to WX widgets, and that gives it just a, a different uh, feel. Um, it's a little bit more responsive. Uh, but it was also uh, switched to C++ uh, from, I believe, Delphi. Um, so it's, it's more in line with our current, current uh, modeling practices at NREL. Uh, it has the same look and feel as the other tools um, that Emerald produces. Um, one other a nice feature is that there's uh, been quite a bit done on the, the ray trace plot, um, and so that uh, has a, a very nice look to it. Um, the second area of improvement is that uh, for, for power tower systems, well, there are tons of elements. I mean, as I mentioned, tens of thousands of elements. Um, it's quite time consuming to trace through all those uh, heliostats and test them all for collision. So we spent some time thinking about how to make that run faster. Um, some people have taken the approach of um, GPU programming or gra graphics card programming with NVIDIA's uh, CUDA language. Um, that's a really powerful technique. There's, there's software out there like uh, Tysol by uh, Titronix. Um, some of you might know uh, Dr. Izagon, he's the, the lead developer of that, but he's got a whole team working on that software. Um, they use GPU processing, so they're able to really quickly churn through you know, tens or hundreds of millions of rays. Um, but for, for this application, we're, we rely on a CPU architecture that only has maybe four, maybe if you're lucky, maybe eight or 10 different threads that you can run in parallel. Um, so what we need to do is look for ways to reduce the computational burden without um, affecting the number of rays that are traced. So in our recent work, um, we took uh, soul trace, and I apologize again, this is, um, didn't quite get to formatting this correctly. Um, but what we have is, is a method uh, where we want to take heliostats that are in some three-dimensional space. So if we just look at the graphic down here, we've got uh, elements that are scattered in three dimensions. And the question is, how do we decide, if we throw a ray into that space, how do we decide uh, which heliostat it hits? You know, do we need to, to enumerate over every single heliostat and test for the ray intersection? Um, or can we just choose a subset of heliostats uh, that are close to the ray and test for that? Well, the problem is, okay, how do you determine which heliostats are close to the ray um, without doing an enumeration over all heliostats? Uh, well, one thing that we could do is project all those heliostats onto a plane, and that reduces the dimensionality of the problem from three down to two, so that's a little easier. And that plane could be, say, normal to the sun. Um, and if you're normal to the sun, then you can just sort of sample throughout this XY space. But even further than that, what we can do is break down the heliostats into uh, local groups. Now, we can't just do a grid breakdown where, say, we've got 
a, a regular coordinate system and we say every heliostat in this um, system uh, only interacts with the heliostats in its local grid because you might say, you know, have a little block here and have a ray hit on this heliostat um, and it ends up being absorbed after reflection by this heliostat, but those two happen to be in different elements. And so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't capture that blocking and shading correctly. So instead of that, what we did is create this binary search tree where we discret uh, discretize this domain um, into this, uh, this tree and all these little zones and, and all these little zones have neighbors, but they, they take a binary address and each heliostat has a binary address. And when you actually traverse that address, you get it's all, uh, all the list of the neighbors. So without going into too much more detail on that, essentially what we can do is search a local group of heliostats uh, where each heliostat has an assignment of local heliostats around it. Uh, and it greatly saves on um, the computational expense. So if we look at the results from, from that exercise, uh, we looked at a couple different cases and, and tried to set baseline times and then look at what the speed impact was on that. So we've got uh, eight different cases and, and you can look through here, but you get a flavor. There, there are different heliostat configurations and spacings and land constraints and et cetera. Um, for each of these cases, this is the number of elements involved. During our, our simulation, if we did not use this technique, uh, this is the time in seconds that it would take to get back one um, field efficiency data point, basically. So you get one field efficiency after running it for, for an hour or for four hours or something like that. Um, well, that's really, really difficult to deal with if you want to use ray tracing for power tower software or for power tower configurations. Um, now, after this technique was uh, implemented, it, it greatly reduced the time. So here, instead of four hours, we were able to do this in, in a little under seven seconds, uh, pretty much everything under 10 seconds for the, the cases we were looking at. So here's the, the factor uh, speed improvement. Um, so that, that's been a nice improvement for SolTrace, and it's, it's enabled us to use it uh, for power towers where previously we'd really only been able to use it um, efficiently for trough systems or dish systems or um, simpler geometries where there were just a handful of elements. All right, so given that we are able to model optical performance with SolTrace, um, you might wonder how we do that. Um, well, one way to do that is through writing your own script or creating a spreadsheet, uh, maybe in Excel or something like that and uh, coming in here and, and pasting all those elements and all their aiming vectors and all their rotation and geometry um, into this uh, table. Um, that's cumbersome, although it can be done and that's something that, that a lot of people have done. Um, you can also do uh, scripting to, to automate those processes. Um, but uh, one of the nice things about Solar Pilot is it actually has built in all the algorithms to do that for you. So um, if we look at the performance simulation page, um, which we can do now, uh, you can see that there's an option for which flux simulation model you want to use. So you can use the analytical by default, uh, or we can use the soul trace. So if we run our analytical model, um, you can see that's very quick, and we get back our flux profile, and we get back our uh, field performance. Uh, we can also um, do the soul trace model. Now, one caveat about soul trace is it doesn't have the ability to calculate aim points. So uh, we've just calculated the aim points using the analytical model. So we'll go ahead and uh, specify keep existing. So it's not going to try and recalculate aim points. And then we can run with our soul trace model. So when we do that, you see the, the drop down here um, and the maximum number of rays and the ray count that you want. Um, we're going to include sun shape and optical errors. And if you want to know where the option is to choose the number of threads to use, um, it's under Tools Settings. And here we can see number of CPUs. We'll set that to three so I don't kill my uh, processor while I'm talking here. And we can trace, say, uh, just for the sake of something, we can trace 100,000 rays. So we click uh, Simulate. 
Um, it'll go ahead and, and run through that. And we get back our flux map uh, with the original aim points. Um, we also see that the results are provided and the results are a little bit less detailed than the analytical model just because from the ray tracing we can't get the same level of fidelity around uh, which loss mechanisms are uh, applied to individual heliostats. We just get a sense of the field as a whole. So you see typically just the mean values presented here. If we want to export that to SolTrace, you can come in here, click the export SolTrace ST input file. Um, I've done that already, called that demo. So then we can go to um, our demo and, and actually open that file, which I've done and shown you here. And you can see sun optics, the optics, uh, receiver, all these different services are provided. Um, by default, I mean, this is automatically generated by Solar Pilot. So we want to come to the trace page. Uh, we'll go ahead and do uh, maybe a million rays uh, with three cores and let that run for probably 20 or 30 seconds here. In the meantime, we'll just keep track of where we are here. So here's what I did. I came in. Uh, one thing that I did want to point out is when you first open SolarPad and go to the trace page, these options on the trace page are not enabled. So by default, it doesn't simulate the sun shape, optical errors, or consider it a point focus system. Um, in almost every case, you want to go ahead and enable those for power towers. Um, if you're running a system that's not point focus, then the uh, technique for discretizing and projecting into a plane doesn't work as reliably. Um, so you may want to go ahead and disable that uh, for maybe trough or linear Fresnel systems um, because uh, you might get uh, poor results. If you're curious or skeptical that the results that you're getting are maybe being affected by that algorithm, you can go ahead and disable that as well. And, um, and that will uh, give you the ability to, to double check your work. So here, okay, we've got our, our intersections. Um, we come in here, do this, um, See if we can clear this out. So we want to look at, at all the rays and all the surfaces or all the stages. And you can see here that what's plotted is every ray intersection um, that, that occurred in the heliostat field. So this is a nice uh, tool for visualizing um, how your field looks. You can kind of get a sense of, uh, of where things are. Um, you can plot your ray paths. Uh, and look at how the flux is coming onto the receiver. Uh, you can zoom in and out, et cetera. Uh, we can also look at the flux map. Um, so this is the flux map for the receiver surface. Um, the convention for this is actually slightly different than Solar Pilot, where uh, this actually does from north to south, um, from here to here, or from north all the way around, whereas uh, Solar Pilot, the north is in the middle. So you, uh, don't be too confused by that, but you see the flux density and you can kind of tune the parameters to make it look how you want. If you do care about the individual ray hits, um, which you may have a lot of time on your hands if that's the case, um, those are all provided here in the data table. All right, so we'll try and move along here. Got, I want to save some time for questions. Um, the last thing I wanted to do was talk about um, the open source projects. Uh, so this is a major development for us. It's something new. Uh, this previously, all the code has been closed source, uh, and we've done all the development ourselves. So it's, it's a bit of a, uh, it's, there's excitement mixed with a bit of fear about how it will go, but uh, we really hope that everybody uh, who's listening here uh, takes interest in these projects and, um, and is willing to contribute because I think there's a lot to be had from the, the CSP world in terms of knowledge and, and capability. So why are we doing this? Uh, well, we're excited to continue working on these tools and fostering a new community of contributors. Um, beyond that, I think, you know, we care about transparency. We're a national lab. We want the things that we do to be available. And so one of the ways that that's uh, increasingly important is actually releasing the code so that people can do what they want with it. Um, 
it also provides flexibility, right? So if you want to implement your own model or uh, change uh, algorithms to be specific um, for what you're doing, uh, you can do that now. Uh, one other aspect is that, you know, we have now the potential for collaboration in a way we didn't before, where if somebody was interested in maybe co-developing with NREL, a technology model or, or doing some work that involved these tools, it was sort of hard to partition out who was going to do what and who would own uh, which aspects of the work. Um, now, because it's open source, we can uh, work together. So you could add a new Healy Sato receiver model with, with the company that's developing those or add new layout techniques for particular developers. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, we'd love to learn how you will use NREL's open source code because it not only is it it's nice for us to know that people are using it, uh, but it also helps us to tailor our efforts and to get funding for specific tasks to develop the tools um, if, if you're able to share what your priorities are. Um, I'll note that we will continue to have official NREL releases for these uh, software packages, and those will be available on the nrel.gov slash CSP website. So we'll have sort of an NREL stamped release for both of these going out. Um, I've put in here some information on the code licenses. Um, you can read through that or, or get that information on your own through the website, but um, the, the gist of it is that uh, research entities, if you're going to be using the open source, so we, we ask that you also make your contributions um, that are based on that uh, open source as well. Uh, that just makes sure that uh, national labs or institutions of higher learning um, that we're all sort of on the same playing field when it comes to using this code. Um, if you are a business, uh, you actually can just go ahead and use this code commercially if you want. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and skip that. So let's get into the open source quad, uh, projects quickly. So first, we'll look at how you go about retrieving and compiling the code. Um, so the code has a, a bunch of different uh, dependencies and libraries that go with it. So this is the Solar Pilot code architecture. You can see up on top, we've got the actual graphical user interface code that's uh, formally called Solar Pilot. Um, the analytical calculation routines are housed within SSC. Um, so that's under SSC slash Solar Pilot. Um, I'll note that if you check out the Solar Pilot uh, GUI project, you don't need to compile SSC separately. You just need to compile the main project because it has project files in there for compiling the, the Solar Pilot. Um, routines in SSC. Uh, we've also got Core Trace, which is the Sol Trace calculation engine. So that's really the core of the Solar Pilot code. Uh, but that code also builds on uh, NREL libraries called WEX and LK. Um, WEX is uh, widgets for the GUI, and LK is scripting support, uh, which we talked about previously. And then, of course, there are development dependencies. Uh, we use WX widgets for the GUI toolkit, uh, C++. And we have operating system options available, so Windows uh, and Linux for Solar Pilot. Uh, and SolTrace, it's very similar, uh, with the exclusion that we've only really got SolTrace, the app, and the core trace on top, and then everything below that is, is basically identical. Um, I'll just point out, I, I put this little floating Google test thing in here uh, because we do plan on incorporating some quality control um, mechanisms into Solar Pilot, at least, uh, through Google Test. And so that's on the horizon. It's, it's um, in our uh, thoughts right now, but not actually in the code. All right, uh, where do you get these uh, codes, the, the code for this? Well, here's where you can download these from the WX Widgets project page and uh, the others from NREL's GitHub channel. If you're not familiar with Git or GitHub, uh, you might want to check out this link at the bottom here. Um, they've got some nice uh, overviews that they do, do a better job than I can do explaining it quickly. So if we want to go ahead and build, this is a very uh, cursory look at it, but um, there are detailed build instructions on the wikis for the um, GitHub page. So Solar Pilot and Solar Trace both have wikis and they've got the, the build uh, steps in detail uh, along with some kind of uh, troubleshooting tips and things like that. Um, but in general, what you need to do 
is uh, get the appropriate uh, development tools. So for Windows, that's Visual Studio, um, probably 2017, and, and you can usually get that for free. Um, you could also probably use VS Code if you want to do that. On uh, Linux, you want the G++ compiler, um, and whichever IDE you want uh, or development environment you want to go with that. Um, the second step is, of course, to download the, the code. So download WX widgets. That should be 3.1.0. Um, build it uh, according to the instructions. And there's some uh, details there. We, it needs to be configured appropriately for these projects. So there's guidance and, con and config files available to help with that process. Uh, and then for each dependency that was listed, uh, fork and clone the repository into a local project folder. And I've just shown up here what that might look like. So you've got all these different projects in the same folder, uh, build each project. And then for Windows, you need to create environment variables that point to the folder location. For, um, for Linux systems, the make files are able to locate uh, the relevant repositories if they're in the same folder. Um, and then you have to build the projects in order. So first, WX widgets, LK, WAX, then Core Trace, then Solar Pilot. Uh, or for Soul Trace, it's just um, this order. Um, I'll note that just for for my computer systems and based on experience, it can take some time. Can take some time to get it right. Um, that you'll probably make some mistakes as you go through the process, and and that'll complain. But in general, I would say if you know exactly what you're doing and just need to wait for the code to compile, it can take probably up to an hour to get through WX widgets and all these different things. Um, although your actual work time will be less than that because it's a lot of it's just compiling time. All right, so probably the most important part is contributing. Um, if you want to contribute, uh, as I said, we'd love to to have that. Uh, we've got some contributing instructions. Um, the SAM ones are maintained. We've also got contributing instructions for Solar Pilot and Soul Trace, and all you need to do is um, sub, sub out SAM here for Solar Pilot or Solar Trace, and you'll get to the, the relevant uh, contributing steps. Um, but one uh, detail or nuance is that if you do contribute, um, the license and, and actually NREL's uh, legal folks ask that uh, you just send an email to the relevant address um, agreeing to the contribution policy just so that we have on record that yeah you're not gonna you know misuse the code or that if you're a, a lab or university that you can uh, you know follow the guidelines and um, and not abuse the system. Um, it's it's really you know nothing significant. It's just uh, basically stating um, that you agree to the terms and there's a, a little template that you can just copy and paste and then we'll we'll hold on to that for future reference. Uh, second steps are to Figure out exactly what it is your change is going to be. So scope that change and estimate how much time it'll take. Um, you don't don't spend you know too much uh, sweat thinking about that. But if you think it's the type of thing that's going to take you know two years, that's that's a different matter than if it's the type of thing that's just a you know a bug in one line of code. Um, if your contributions are small, then go ahead and just submit the changes via pull request. But if it's uh, big or significant, we ask that. Um, you submit a description of the change uh, so that uh, really it's it's a benefit you know for for the developer so that you don't spend you know a months developing some feature that's really useful for you and in the end we say well that's not actually consistent with the goals of uh, the project or something that NREL can uh, include for for various reasons and then you know you've wasted your time or it, you, you'll be um, you know a little upset at the fact that you spent time doing something that um, we actually couldn't go ahead and use in the end. Um, so it's just, it's a safeguard that uh, makes sure everybody's happy in the end. And, and it helps us keep tabs on uh, what people are doing, what the intended development path is, and it helps us gauge um, how we might be able to get funding to support those kind of activities. Um, so half the battle on this uh, beyond knowing what you're doing is knowing where to contribute. Um, as I said, Solar Pilot consists of uh, several code repositories on that previous slide. Uh, so you do need to determine where you're going to make your contribution. 
if you're making a change to Solar Pilot's underlying performance um, algorithms, only the SSC repository is affected. So that Solar Pilot code, the, the core engine lives within SSC, and you'd only need to deal with SSC uh, in that regard. Uh, however, if you're adding a new feature, that changes both the calculations and the user interface. Um, in that case, you'd be working in multiple repositories. If you're adding scripting functionality, the scripting is actually mostly handled within the Solar Pilot repository, that is the function definitions and everything are there. But if you're going to be modifying the script language tools or adding language functionality, then the LK repository is affected and, and you need to work there. Um, now, this is all a little confusing, so if you need help figuring out where your contribution should go, just please let us know, and there's a link there to, um, to uh, our email address. Okay, so here's a, here's a quick overview, and I think one of the last things we'll talk about before taking questions of the process. So step one is install your favorite Git client application. It doesn't have to be any particular one. Um, I found that Git Bash works best for for my uh, for my usage, uh, but you may be very familiar with something else, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, second, we create a fork off the repo, so you click the fork button, it'll fork it to your account. Um, so a sub note there is you probably will need to have a GitHub account to do this. Um, they're free, so it's not a big deal. Um, so fork that, and it'll copy over your uh, uh, this repository to your account, and then you can make your changes and commits there, and then eventually submit pull requests from that. Um, three is uh, clone the fork and build according to instructions. Four is then go ahead and create a branch off the fork to to um, to make the change. So if you're adding a new feature, um, you want to you want a branch off of the develop branch, and the develop is kind of the bleeding edge. It's the latest version. It's generally stable but could be unstable um, or if you want to go and actually fix a bug in a prior release what you need to do is check out that tagged release so you'd see get checkout v something you can hit tab and see what the options are um, go ahead and check that out and then from that create a new branch i've called it my patch branch and it'll branch off of there and uh, you can create your patch and then submit a pull request back for that um, the fifth step is to make your modifications. Here you can see I'm just doing that uh, something uh, trivial in Visual Studio. Um, six is build and test, and please, please build and test. Don't just submit things because um, I guarantee they will not work the first time. Uh, seven, commit and push your changes to, to your branch that's in your repository. So you need to make sure that you set up the push to your remote. So if you that might be your username or whatever the URL is that you are um, that you've cloned from uh, so push that to your branch uh, add descriptive tags on the commits so that we know what's going on um, and then lastly uh, once everything is ready and stable and tested you can start a pull request on github uh, where you can ask that your changes be incorporated back into develop if it's a new feature or into the uh, the patch release if um, if it's a patch or bug fix. Um, one note is that we'll, we'll actually review those contributions before we accept them and, and give you any comments or anything if we want some changes. Um, okay, so I'll skip that. Uh, and I will at this point thank you for your attention and uh, we can go ahead and take questions for uh, the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Thanks, Mike, for... Uh Good overview of some great software. Um, there's looks like there's uh, one hand raised, so I'll unmute uh, Luis's line. It looks like he's self-muted. Luis, if you have a question, go ahead and, and unmute yourself. Otherwise, you could type your question in the question box. Um, if anyone has a question, please feel free to type it or raise your hand.
So while people are doing that, if you do have any questions, great. Um, otherwise, feel free to get in contact with me um, at either Solar Pilot support, solarpilot.support at nrl.gov or soltrace support at nrl.gov. Um, I prefer those if they're related to the software. Um, my personal email address is also out there if you uh, would like to email me directly, but I'm the one monitoring those other accounts, so it, um, it might make sense just to go through the appropriate channel. Um, so unless other people have questions, I can just quickly talk about uh, these slides I, I skipped over. So here we've got um, some information on the branching, and, and Paul, go ahead and interrupt me if you do see a question come through. Okay. So I mentioned that we've got the develop and patch uh, branches, but we also have this master branch. And so this, the, the approach that we're taking for branching in, in this structure is that everything uh, related to feature development um, is housed in the develop branch once that's ready to kind of go out. Um, but then if you have uh, new features that you wanted to create, you would branch off of develop. So here on the right, you can see uh, what looks kind of like this history of commits. We've got our develop branch. We're going right along and somebody wants to create new features. So you branch off of the develop branch, you make your commits. Later on, we come back and ask to merge those back into develop through a pull request. Um, so that is the kind of day-to-day -day development. Now, every time we go through an official release, what we'll do is we'll take our develop code uh, and create a release branch. And from that release branch, we'll uh, get things in order, set the version number, et cetera, uh, get things so they're uh, fully stable. No new features will be added, only bug fixes. And then at some point, uh, when we're ready to release, we go ahead and merge that uh, release branch into the master branch. And so master is the current stable release that corresponds with the public uh, NREL releases of the software. Uh, we manage those uh, through the tag system. So if you, uh, it, we would then go ahead and tag it which, with whichever semantic version number it corresponds to. And then if you want to check that out, it's easy to go ahead and say, get check out whatever the tag number is. And you can easily go back to the, the stable versions. Um, so this is this table kind of gives you uh, an overview of how this workflow is supposed to go. Um, we follow this outline that was uh, given by, uh, by this article, and this graphic is borrowed from there. So if you want more information on what we're expecting to do, this is a good uh, resource to read through. Um, okay, so see no questions, so I'll just cover this side quickly. Um, when we do uh, development, what we want is to keep track and document the both the intent behind the development and the actual changes that we've made um, in the code. So we can do that very easily with GitHub through this issues uh, tab. So when you know you have identified a bug or you've identified a new feature that you'd like to see, uh, please go to the Issues tab, create a new issue, and you can add in graphics and description and just give a full account of, um, if it's a bug, give an account of uh, how you found it, what the conditions are to recreate it, maybe attach a case file if it's associated with a case file, um, maybe some instructions on what you've done so far to look into the bug, uh, where you recommend people go. Um, and that's that's really the first step in, in working together as a community to kind of address the development of the software. So we'll, we'll handle that through the issues. Um, as pull requests come in, we'll say, this pull request uh, fixes issue number 19. We'll tag that, it'll automatically close the issue, and then we're, we're good to keep going. Um, so really, issues is a good place to make a list of, of everything we want to see done in the software. Um, and then the interface tools are nice to do that. So, all right. So that, I think I'm out of time there. Um, and I don't see any, any more questions at the moment, but like I said, please 
uh, do feel free to reach out to me and, and I appreciate your time. Great, thank you, Mike. And just a reminder that we'll be posting a link to a re recording of this presentation on the SAM website, sam.nrel.gov, on the webinars page. Um, and with that, I think we'll we'll end the session. So goodbye, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>